we have people from different places. Uh, maybe it's time to get started. We are three minutes in. Um, good morning, good evening from wherever you're joining us today. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the Hoodie Community Sync for uh, September month. My name is Bhavani Sudha Sakteshwaran. I'm a PMC member in the Apache Hoodie Project. Um, if you're new here, Community Sync allows community users and developers to meet, interact, and exchange ideas on Apache Hoodie and how it is implemented in various organizations for their data lake or lakehouse architecture. Today, we have a very interesting presentation from Peloton's data platform team. During this presentation, our speakers, whom I will introduce in a few minutes, um, they will discuss their experience in uh, building a hoodie-powered data lake, uh, tailored specifically for analytics using change data capture from relational databases to build fresh and fast machine learning workflows. So uh, before we go into the actual presentation, we'll be quickly going over the community stats and updates. Then we'll start our session and end with a quick Q&A. Uh, since the session is live on Hoodie, feel free um, uh, live on LinkedIn. Feel free to you know post your comments or questions there uh, in the chat as well, and uh, we can take it from there. All right, let's get started. Uh, so in the last month, um, we had over seventy seven PRs. Uh, this is a screenshot taken from Pulse Insight from the GitHub um, stats. Um, a lot of activities has been proving on the Hoodie project side. We had uh, 39 developers who contributed to these PRs. We also closed like 36 issues during this time, and uh, there are also new PRs that are being worked on. Um, in terms of community growth numbers, we have over 4,450 plus users uh, on Slack today. As you know, Slack is a great place for uh, the Hoodie users to bring uh, bring up any discussions, issues, or questions while implementing Hoodie, uh, sharing knowledge guides, and uh, there are PMCs to chat there as well. I'll share the link in the next slide for you to join. Uh, there is also a QR code that you can use to scan and join. Um, on GitHub, we now have 5,300 plus stars, so there's really good momentum there. And of course, I uh, mentioned before about the 39 contributors in the last month. The community is growing on all aspects. If you haven't already, please um, give us a follow on LinkedIn and Twitter. Give us a star on GitHub if you love and use Hoodie. Um, you can also scan the QR code here to join the Slack community. With that, uh, let's welcome our speakers. We have Arun, Kenny, Amresh, and Gabriel from Peloton's data platform team who are joining us today. Um, Arun and team, I'll uh, just add you to the stage, and then you can take it over. Please go ahead, Arun. Hello, everyone. Excited to be here. Um, hope you're able to see my screen. Um, so in terms of uh, what we'll be covering today, we'll be um, walking through how we modernize the data infrastructure at Peloton uh, using Hoodie. Before I go forward, let me introduce myself on the team. Uh, I'm Arun Vasudevan. I'm a staff engineer on the data platform team here in Peloton. and. Uh, Kenny, Amresh, and Gabriel uh, are the KitKast engineers on the team. They'll be introducing themselves uh, later in the presentation. So here uh, about the agenda, we'll introduce uh, Peloton and talk about our old architecture and some of the challenges we faced and how we modernized it and uh, how we are able to uh, uh, benefit out of it. Uh, the majority of the presentation would focus on some of the challenges we faced in implementing the Hoodie Data Lake and how we overcame it, um, some of the, the solutions um, uh, in terms of uh, implementing the Data Lake. And we'll end with uh, the operational metrics and monitoring, the next steps, and Q&A. So first, let me introduce uh, Peloton. Peloton is an interactive fitness platform. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, popular across uh, across the world, used by millions of members. It introduced started with a stationary bike uh, and now branched out to into tread, rover, app, guide, uh, and into multiple modalities as well. In terms of the architecture, um, here is a high overview of our old architecture. Um, all the metrics from uh, Various workouts uh, are pushed onto an RDS Postgres uh, database. Um, in, then, like in order for the analytics systems to read those uh, data, uh, we would take a read replica 
we would have a read replica of that RDS Postgres uh, where in which uh, snapshots are taken daily. And these snapshots are loaded into Redshift. And uh, for some of the critical tables, there would be an hourly incremental, which is read, at, re read from um, read replicas and pushed onto Redshift. So uh, as, as you could see, uh, until the snapshot is complete uh, on a daily basis, uh, the reports cannot be published and the recommendation systems are also working out of the snapshots. So let me cover in detail on some of these challenges. So as I highlighted, uh, hinted a little bit earlier, uh, the daily reporting cannot complete until the snapshots are complete. It is that snapshots on our monolith uh, Postgres database would take anywhere from two to three hours. And uh, the further uh, DBD models and pushing on to Looker. So all this were taking like close to like four to five hours for our reports to be available. And uh, this was a considerable bottleneck for us um, in terms of like reacting to uh, the, the changing data. And the recommended systems are also constrained to a daily recommendation model uh, based out of the batch, uh, based out of the snapshots. And there was a tight coupling between online and the analytic system. Um, the microservice migrations uh, would be very complex. Uh, just because everything has to be completed in one move without a phased approach uh, or any change to the online system, uh, the, the analytic system also have to go along with it at the same time. So uh, due to maintaining a database read replica, the, the costs were high. Uh, so these were like some of the challenges uh, when I started and how we uh, addressed it with Hoodie. Uh, so once we introduced Hoodie, uh, the RDS, all the uh, data from RDS Postgres as it gets inserted, the change data capture using Debezium would push it into MSK, into Kafka, right? Um, so from the change data capture from Kafka is read using a custom Spark Hoodie writer. I'll cover more on like why we used a custom uh, Hoodie writer later in the presentation. So we would read from the change capture uh, and then write it onto a, a S3 data lake on top of Hoodie, right? And those changes are pushed into our data warehouse, which is Redshift and uh, the recommendation systems were also able to consume that data. So as you could see some of the major gains here, we don't have to wait for snapshots to complete. The data is available under 30 minutes in the lake, any change capture, 20 to 30 minutes. Uh, so this would uh, power our dashboards to be near real time. Uh, and also our recommendation systems uh, don't have to work only on a batch system. They can work on an intraday recommendations. It gives a possibility. And, the, and the, there's a faster move from monolith to microservice as well, because uh, the analytic systems don't have to change along with the online systems. Uh, the online systems could uh, double write into both the monolith database as well as the microservice database. And uh, we would uh, propagate those writes uh, for, the, for the analytics. And later on, um, once the analytic systems also move to the microservice architecture, microservice tables, we could then cut off writes on the monolith. So it provides a much more phased approach, it helps in moving faster for different teams to act on their timeline. And also like the time travel queries for uh, training recommendation models. So our uh, recommendation teams could uh, point to a specific instant of time and train their models based on that. Uh, and also like Hoodie helped us to be like GDPR compliant. Uh, all the upstream deletes are propagated downstream to the data lake without having any additional manual work to be, to be in place uh, and also no additional cost. Uh, in terms of reprocessing data. And the last thing is the cost saving. As I said earlier, the read replica is uh, is not needed anymore. So we reduced considerable cost with respect to that. So it's at a high level, uh, the Peloton um, tech stack uh, as we have it now. Um, as you could see, the overall theme is we, we leverage a lot of uh, AWS services. Uh, the data stores are like, 
we leverage Postgres, RDS Postgres, and DynamoDB. Um, and also, like, the change capture is using Debezium. Uh, and the event bus is on, like, MSK. Uh, orchestrator is MWAA. And the data processing is done on EMR using Apache Spark. Uh, we use a custom hoodie writer. Um, the next slide, I will cover why the custom hoodie writer is. And in terms of like storage and analytics, uh, we use uh, S3, um, hoodie, hoodie on S3. And the analytics is on Redshift. Uh, the DBT models uh, read from the Redshift and, uh, and the data is available on Looker. And all this data is connected uh, to Data Hub. Uh, data Hub is our data catalog. Uh, as you could also see, the current the the talks focused on the EMR version six twelve zero, which is in which is on top of Hoodie version thirteen dot one. So so why a custom Hoodie writer, right? So when we started building the data lake, um, the latest Hoodie version at that time was zero eight zero. Uh, so when we looked at propagating changes, uh, reading data from Debezium, Delta Streamer at that point did not have support for Debezium. Uh, but as we went on with the project uh, in the later hoodie version in 10.0, we saw the support was added, but we were well on way uh, with our custom hoodie writer and having our custom logic in. So we didn't like uh, change course at that point. But if you are to start now, um, Delta Streamer seems a viable option. I don't have personal experience on it, but it, it seems in parity. In terms of like uh, some of the decisions that we made in the hoodie data lake uh, depends on some of the decisions that we made on the CDC. So I'll just cover a couple of points here. Um, so the replication on the monolith database uh, is, is basically uh, we chose to use partial replication. Uh, the reason for that is uh, to give you, uh, to bring you up to speed, the full replication gets both the before and the after records uh, in the change capture, right? So uh, that would considerably increase the write ahead log growth on the monolith database. As we were concerned about the stability of uh, monolith, uh, we didn't want to like uh, add full replication to that. So we went with the partial replication. So due to this uh, partial replication decision, uh, for the deletes, uh, the partial replication only provides the before of the delete primary key, and that's about it. It doesn't give any other fields with it. Uh, so because of that, we have to make a choice of uh, using our data lake um, partitions based on the primary key uh, of Postgres. Uh, we were not able to use like date partition or any other fields as partition. Uh, so, but this constraint is uh, is no longer applicable once we like moved out of monolith for some of these tables into its own microservice databases. In that case, the uh, right ahead log growth is not a concern at that point. So we could pivot um, to a full replication and choose to use other partition keys. So in terms of format, uh, Due to the uh, microservice, uh, microservices applications consuming the change data capture, um, we initially uh, went with the protobuf schema, right? Uh, so as we produced the CDC data and the data lake and um, consumed it, we we figured out that there was an issue in that mainly because protobuf was not able to differentiate between nulls and defaults, and it was causing our uh, uh, data engineering models to like affect, right? So we quickly changed course to produce Avro format. Uh, Avro, uh, Avro works great for, great for us. In terms of the uh, data lake ingestion architecture, um, so many of the aspects of data, such as data quality, uh, privacy, and lineage, uh, all these we addressed uh, right at the get go um, as we like added these uh, upstream Postgres tables into the data lake. Uh, so as we ingested, we have a, a YAML file, as you could see here, based on like uh, from which topic and the primary key to like the quality aspects. So here you see a validation uh, with the Postgres data, wherein like we are checking if the row count is within a tolerance of 1%, right? Uh, 
between the change data capture and the source data. If that uh, increases, then we trigger alerts to like check what that could be, right? And you could also have additional checks based on like null checks or any other uh, tolerance values based on the quality. And the encryption is based on like, we provide what are the privacy uh, fields within the specific table so that uh, downstream libraries can pick up uh, to encrypt those fields on the data lake. And the lineage uh, between like the Kafka topic and the downstream table is also established here. And all this data is pushed onto Data Hub for our uh, data consumers. And in terms of data tools, um, so uh, the EMR wrapper is basically like for anyone interfacing with, uh, with the EMR, uh, some of the concerns such as like the spot instance percentages or the EMR version to use or what instance types uh, are allowed. So everything is being like uh, wrapped in this library so that not everyone has to scale up to understand the fleet instances or uh, in terms of when we have to manage costs. Uh, it's possible uh, with the spot instance percentages and other uh, uh, other uh, changes or settings within the EMR wrapper. So uh, it, it allowed us to scale EMR uh, within Peloton. And in terms of the crypto shredding library, uh, we used uh, uh, like the PAI fields from the YAML that I showed earlier to, uh, to encrypt those fields on the data lake and we applied a crypto shredding algorithm for that. In terms of data validation library, this was mainly useful um, uh, when we initially like cut over uh, to the data lake. Uh, so all the records from the data lake is validated against the upstream snapshot for data accuracy. This provided a lot of confidence for our downstream consumers to like move in. And the last library that I wanna cover is the data quality wherein like, um, all the data quality checks based on the tolerance values uh, are applied and pushed onto Data Hub. And uh, the airflow sensors, MWA sensors, stop execution of the downstream pipelines if any of the data quality checks fail. Uh, right? So it, uh, it's a circuit breaker check, wherein, like, if, the, if any of the, the quality checks on the data fails, uh, then don't run the downstream pipelines. Uh, so it will trigger alerts for us to. Uh, look at the data so the downstream is not polluted. Now we'll hand it over to Amresh. Um, Amresh is going to walk over the choice between uh, copy and write versus merge and read for us and various other uh, challenges that we faced with. Hey, hey everyone. Uh, I'm Amresh, senior engineer on the data platform team. I've been working with the data platform team for about one and a half uh, years now. Cool. Thanks, Arun, for passing it over. Uh, like Arun said, we built our data lake with uh, CDC. Uh, so before deciding to build with CDC, we looked at all the different open table formats that are available. We decided to go with Hoodie mainly because of the features it has at that time. And uh, one of the important one was the time travels, which was really important for us. Uh, Hoodie supports two different kinds of uh, table formats. One is the COW, which is the copy on write, and the other one is the MOR, which is merge on read. We started off with COW mainly because our partner teams were using Redshift Spectrum for some of the data that they want for analytics, and Redshift Spectrum only supports COW tables. That's, that's mainly because COW is stores data completely as Parquet files in no other format, and Redshift Spectrum can easily decode that and work with it. The other main reason why we started off with COW, it's, it's much easier for a new person onboarding to build a data lake because they don't have to, or the team doesn't have to know the in-depth workings of uh, compaction or cleaning or how is the storage handled and anything around that. COW is super quick to onboard. So just to give a quick uh, primer or recap for what exactly a copy on write table is and what exactly a merge on read table is. So on the left, it's, uh, it's a representation of how a COW stores data. So COW stores data only in Parquet files and each Parquet file is called a base file and uh, there are multiple base files for a single table 
and the number of base files depends on uh, your partitioning strategy and everything around that. So let's say you have 10 rows that are getting added into one base file yesterday. And if you end up updating eight rows out of them, Hudi will update uh, these rows. But then for COW, there is no easy way to update because uh, in Parquet, if you need to update anything, you need to read everything from the starting of it and then go to that specific row and change everything. So Hudi intelligently tries to copy everything into a new file. Uh, before copying, it will just make the new updates and then copy into the new file. So what happens is in the COW, there are multiple uh, versions of the same file and each version will have the new updates. And the older versions are deleted based, based on your delete strategy or the clean strategy. On the MOR side of things, MOR intelligently stores a way to reduce the processing times. So MOR also has base files, which are the parquet files. It also has another set of files called the delta log files, which are in Avro format. So these delta log files just have the new updates that are coming in, and then they just get appended to the existing Avro files. So uh, as, as we all know, just appending to an existing file is much quicker than reading the existing file and then changing the exact spot. So this way, our write latencies reduce a lot. And then uh, our write latencies reduce a lot, but the read latencies can be increased because now our data is split across base files and the uh, delta files. But how MOR helps here is it runs uh, the table services compaction and cleaner. So compaction merges these base files and the uh, row based or the delta log files to get all the updates into the base files so that the read is also optimized after a while. So this way, COW differs from MOR and it helps with two different use cases. Like, do you are you optimizing for your reads or are you optimizing for your writes? Good. Next, next slide, please. Aaron. Cool. Uh, so we started off with COW. It, it was working well for us for most of the time, but we decided to switch to MR. So why did we make switch? There were two major reasons. We were missing SLOs on some of the tables. So we, we wanted to get in data every single hour from our uh, source databases like Postgres and other databases into our data lake. So we had like every one hour batch processing. We were missing SLOs on some of these highly updated tables. So there were so many updates coming in every single hour and then writing them to our data lake was taking more than an hour, which was causing us to miss SLOs. So why was it taking more than an hour? It's it's because partly because of our partitioning strategy. Uh, our partitioning strategy might not have been right for the kind of data that was coming in and it was trying to update in all the partitions in every single run. And as we know now that COW copies the base files and rewrites them. So this copy and rewrite causes too much processing time. It costs us money and time. And the other one, uh, other reason why we moved to MOR was increased costs. So our EMR costs were going up due to processing and then our storage costs were going up uh, because of this copied files. We were storing 30 days of commits. Uh, we had a reason to support our recommender systems to be able to time travel and get like a specific uh, view of a table that's why we that's why we had like a 30 days of uh, commits uh, and the average size per table is around is multiples of hundreds of gb but our uh, most used tables or most frequently updated tables exceeded around like 3 terabytes and even more than that so in order to get back to our slos and reduce our costs we we had to switch to mr with cow we could have gotten back to our SLOs, but that means we had to increase our EMR cluster sizes, which in turn costs more money. So we didn't want to do that. Good. Next slide. Right. So how did we bring faster updates to Data Lake? So now that we moved to MOR, we were running our, uh, so our processing times reduced drastically because MOR is optimized for uh, write latency. Uh, so our processing time for writes is improved a lot. So we started uh, running our jobs from like every 10 to 15 minutes instead of one hour runs previously. So this got our uh, fresher updates to data lake. So anybody 
who wants much quicker data can use this MOR version of the table, which is the underscore uh, uh, RT tables that create that gets created as part of MOR. And then the other major update we did was to reduce the number of commits to seven days from 30 days to save on storage costs. Uh, our, we, we worked with our partner teams to understand which tables they need for more than seven days. And then we had like different configs for each of them. And then the third one was uh, we started running uh, the cleaner and compaction services uh, async. So Hoodie has uh, multiple flavors of uh, these table services, I mean, multiple flavors of how you can run these table services. There's offline running, there's async running, and then there's inline running. We started off with uh, async. So this immediately reduced our uh, write latency and helped with us with our SLOs. Uh, but there's some caveats which I'll be talking soon. Uh, but And then uh, this also reduced our cost because we were not storing the same amount of data and we were not uh, basically copying and rewriting the base files over and over again. Cool. Next slide. So like the challenges that uh, we were facing with MOR, it was mainly on the table services, uh, the cleaner and compaction. We started off with async to reduce uh, write latencies. And like I said, it worked for most part. Uh, but there were some very specific issues when there were concurrent uh, writers or cleaners or readers happening. So some of the issues we faced was the major conflict. One of the conflict was uh, when there's a writer job happening and then the cleaner tries to delete the file. So it's it's basically like two different or two concurrent jobs happening at the same time. Uh, one of them uh, will just fail saying file not found errors or the other one saying the file is locked or anything around that. So we resolved this using adding DynamoDB locks. This resolved the conflict itself, but added some latencies on our uh, write jobs. And the next conflict was between readers and cleaners. Uh, so one very specific case was our partner teams were trying to do a time travel query on one of the tables. Uh, at the same time, the cleaner was trying to clean the same table and it marked a file to be cleaned. But the reader already pulled the metadata to read that specific file for the time travel read. In that case, we started seeing file not found errors because the cleaner cleaned it, but the reader job pulled the metadata for that specific file to read. So this caused quite a bit of issues for us. We had to tweak the run, we had to tweak the run times of when the cleaners will run so that it doesn't affect our partner teams. But uh, we we ended up uh, doing doing something else and moving off uh, async uh, table services. So the other uh, error was due to EMR node terminations. This was caused. Uh, this there were multiple reasons for it. There were the memory was getting too high on one of the nodes, or uh, the shuffle memory was not available, or spot terminations. All these caused issues on uh, mainly on the compaction side of things. So it created some orphan files. So the compaction files are there, but they're never referenced uh, in the actual commit. So we had to develop utilities to clean that thing or run the cleaner immediately so that those orphan files are deleted. So we, we debugged a lot. We tried to create a lot of custom solutions, but we finally ended up going with uh, inline table services. So inline means they run, uh, I mean, the compaction and the cleaner run uh, with your writer jobs right after the writer jobs are done. So we went with this. So we don't run inline services on every single writer job run, but we run on uh, like after like six commits or seven commits or based on our strategy, we, we run custom logic and intelligently decide when to run it. So the trade-off was write latency increased a little bit on few of these runs where these table uh, services get triggered. But we are happy to take this trade-off uh, versus the errors and the pager duty alerts we were seeing. Cool. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, so this is another challenge. This is a very interesting uh, challenge that we faced. So. Whenever, so how Hoodie behaves, or for that matter, any open table format behaves is whenever we do an updates to the table and bring in the CDC and write it to a data lake table, uh, it you can you have the ability to sync it to an external catalog. So in our case, we sync it to AWS Glue using the MetaSync enabled config on Hoodie to reflect the latest schema of the table. 
So with increase in the number of commits and number of updates, uh, we hit a very specific hoodie error, which was not clearly obvious on what the issue was. So it, it just said it's a hoodie exception and uh, it was in the sync util helpers. We tried to look into the code, but we couldn't find exactly what was happening and where it was happening. So after several pages on different services, we finally found out that it was due to some AWS resource limits. So AWS has some quota limits on these table versions across databases and across accounts. So we had a limit of 1 million uh, uh, table versions uh, for all the databases in a, in a specific AWS account. And that was causing the issue. So we had to change that. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so the short-term solution we went to it was we worked with AWS to incre increase the resource limits. It, it's a really quick uh, update from AWS side, and then uh, that that solved our issue, and all our uh, jobs started running again, and then schema started syncing to AWS Glue. Uh, the other uh, short-term solution we implemented was uh, we wrote a Python service basically that finds and deletes all the old table versions. We decided how many versions we want to keep on every table, like let's say 200 or 300 or 500. And then we deleted everything older than that. So we were we deleted more than a million plus table versions across all the databases in all environments. We found that uh, some of these highly updated tables had 35,000 table versions per table. So this this was like a huge win for us, and then it uh, gave us some breathing time before we implemented long term solution. So the, for the long term solution, what we implemented was uh, we started running this table, uh, this Python utility as an Airflow job that runs once a week and finds and deletes any table version. So this was like an this was uh, like a solution we implemented for our team, but it ended up helping uh, all the teams that use AWS Glue in in our AWS accounts. Uh, we also developed another custom logic to intelligently update uh, these glue databases whenever it's required. Uh, my teammate Kenny will uh, dive deeper into it. Cool. Thanks, folks. Kenny, you can take it on. Hey, Ron. Uh, Kenny here. Um, yeah, I'll be covering a, a set of different challenges that we uh, face throughout our implementa uh, implementation of our hoodie pipelines uh, and then dive into uh, the the glue schema uh, improvement that we've done later. Uh, but first, uh, the first challenge that I wanted to dive into was like was the increase in cost that we had as we were trying to implement uh, our Hootie pipelines. And uh, as mentioned before, we had like some strict SLOs that we wanted to hit. Uh, we wanted to hit 10 to 15 minutes between like when the data would like arrive into our, our data lake. Uh, and in turn, we would have to increase the resources on our EMR clusters to achieve that. Um, yeah, so essentially, as we were building out uh, and shrinking our SLOs, we started spending more and more money on EMR. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Yeah, um, so this is not uh, particularly Hootie specific, but uh, one of the main things that we did uh, while using EMR was to essentially optimize our, our EMR clusters uh, to to optimally use the resources that uh, uh, that we prov provisioned in the first place. We ended up over provisioning a lot uh, in order to hit the SLOs. Uh, but after using different tools like Ganglia, Spark History Server, and stuff like that, we managed to shrink our like our cost footprint uh, significantly. So if you look at the, the chart on the left, that's just like a cluster without any optimizations. Uh, you can see like a majority of the time that it's been running uh, the top red bar is like the total memory and then the actual usage is shown in the bars below um, in this situation there are many things that we could have done we could uh, probably do some auto scaling here to to shrink it down uh, on the right side uh right ganglia chart we essentially ran a, a long-running emr cluster uh, that's running a few jobs and then we incrementally uh, decreased the amount of like resources that were uh, allocated to that EMR cluster until we came to a point in which we thought that the percentage of resources used uh, like was uh, sufficient for our jobs. Uh, and like doing this, we managed to save like 30 to 40% of our uh, EMR costs. Um, you can go to the next slide. 
so aside from like gang that uh, there were some other like after reducing our resources across like our EMR clusters, we we looked into like other ways that we could uh, save our costs by like looking in uh, other ways to decrease our job runtime. Uh, and in turn, like we could reduce the resources that we initially uh, provisioned to try to get it to run super fast. So one of the things that we did uh, was to identify any inefficiencies in our jobs. And we actually found uh, a small bug when we were using Hootie Medisync enabled configuration. Um, and you could see inside this uh, chart below is that we had like uh, peaks of like when we're actually doing processing. And we saw like periods of time in which we did not see much uh, activity in our Spark cluster. And we actually worked with the Hootie, uh, multiple members of the Hootie community to kind of identify this. Um, but essentially, we turned on debug, Hootie debug logs and everything like that. And we saw that the most of the time, uh, the actions being done here during like this low uh, memory, uh, memory usage time is that everything was happening on the driver load node. And it turns out that we uh, the Spark step was loading the entire archive timeline. Um, and it basically was taking too long doing that, uh, making our jobs take like four, four times longer. Um, to go to the next slide. Um, yeah, so this is just another uh, thing that we use. We used a Spark history server to identify uh, here. Uh, what we uh, mentioned in the last slide is essentially there was this idle time going on here. Nothing was going on. Um, and uh, we essentially uh, figured out that that, that was an issue. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, and so like, how do we actually reduce the cost here? Um, we changed our pipeline to conditionally uh, turn on that Hive sync enabled configuration, uh, like allowing us to cut down, like skip the entire archive reading step. Uh, and this would mean that our SLOs on average would like decrease uh, when we, and then when we actually have a schema update, then we would uh, turn on the, the MetaSync enabled again. Uh, so. The actual bug, I believe, has been fixed since 14, uh, like Hootie uh, 0.14 and greater. Um, but the, uh, another benefit of this change that we did was that we are updating our glue schema less uh, because we turned off this feature. So it actually uh, uh, benefited in, uh, benefited us in multiple ways. Uh, next, yes. Uh, so that was like basically how we uh, reduce our costs. Uh, I was gonna, wanted to jump into like one of our next uh, challenges. And this is purely related to our CDC pipelines. For anyone using Postgres, uh, they might know like this issue. And this issue is called, uh, well, is primarily when we deal with toast columns. Uh, and when you're doing CDC with Postgres, uh, like toast is essentially uh, the mechanism on Postgres where you when you store large values, um, it is stored in multiple physical rows and like a large, value is basically anything over like eight kilobytes. Um, how this affects us in CDC is that like when an update comes to any uh, record that has a value that's over eight kilobytes, uh, when when we actually get the record from our Debezium pipeline, uh, like our Debezium service uh, through CDC, it actually comes as a Debezium unavailable, uh, uh, Debezium unavailable uh, value. So you can see in the, in the chart below, when we upgrade, uh, update the column two for the PK two, like what used to be just like the value that was like uh, over eight kilobytes, actually is passed through as a Debezium unavailable value. Uh, next slide. So how uh, we actually fixed this is uh, we uh, essentially did a self join on like the current Hootie data that we already have on our uh, on our Hootie data lake. Uh, when we get an incremental update that has a, a division of unavailable value, we do a join on our current Hootie data, and uh, then our downstream or the the data lake is updated with like full information. Um, this this uh, functionality, uh, we believe, like this is also the implementation that's actually being used in Delta Streamer also. So uh, so if you are using uh, or if you are using Delta Streamer and working with Postgres, uh, I believe that you could use uh, like the this joining mechanism is uh, 
holds up what's going on behind the scenes. Uh, you can go to 10x. Uh, yeah, so although like we, we solved that, we actually found uh, that there were some edge, edge cases uh, that we had when we were uh, processing our data. Uh, essentially, because Spark is basically doing micro batches, if we had a batch that had multiple operations, uh, let's say like an insert and update at the same time, uh, it, they would all be in the same batch. And since our pre-combined field was like the timestamp, we would only pull the latest uh, event, right? Uh, so this means that like if we created, uh, if through CDC we pulled in the actual creation of a record and that record was updated like multiple times right afterwards, uh, we would only get the Debezium unavailable value as our final uh, data point uh, record. So how we fix this was basically we split up that batch into multiple batches. We had a batch of inserts and a batch of uh, updates and the deletes so that we uh, could eventually have the, the full data in our data lake. Um, yeah, so I that was one of the, the edge cases that we dealt with here. We There are actually some other edge cases when dealing with Toast and some other CDC related things that uh, have like, pat that basically go through uh, and leave us with like some missing uh, updates here and there. So in order to do that, we built out a, a, a self-healing reconciliation pipeline uh, that would heal our data. And our my teammate, Gabriel, will uh, dive into that a little bit more. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks, Kenny. Um, so as Kenny mentioned, uh, the solution we implemented cover most of the edge cases, but there are some other edge cases that we use this reconciliation pipeline to deal with. Two of the examples are when we have multiple updates in a single batch, we sometimes end up with a toast unavailable value. And another edge case is that when we have like a great delete create and then delete operation on some of the high frequency table on the same PK in the same batch, we end up missing some of the delete. Uh, at the graph show below, uh, it's an example of how reconciliation do the auto heating process. So as you can see, the PK one is where we talked about the create delete and create delete pattern. And we sometimes miss that delete. And PK2 is when we have multiple updates in a single batch and we end up in a toast unavailable value. The way we solve this is leveraging a Lambda architecture where we do the real-time processing in uh, during business hour and we do the batch processing, which takes longer time but guarantee more accurate data of business hour. So the way we do it is we first join our current hoodie data against our current Postgres snapshot data which is the um, truth of, uh, source of truth from the upstream data. And then we join again on the delete ID data so that we can update the value, uh, the unavailable toast value and guarantee the delete is taken care of. That's our reconciliation pipeline. Uh, while we were building the reconciliation pipeline, one of the biggest challenge we run into is the runtime. So the majority of our uh, downstream user starts their pipeline around 8 a.m. UTC every day, and we kick off our reconciliation pipeline 12 a.m. UTC. So um, we want to guarantee that whenever the downstream pipeline started, the data in the data lake is accurate. But sometimes we have the reconciliation pipeline run over nine hour, which is not accepted. So the, uh, the way we deal with that is we have uh, we basically distribute some of the reconciliation pipeline into additional EMR. We do uh, incur some of the additional cost, but we manage to keep the reconciliation pipeline run under seven hours. That's our reconciliation pipeline. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, another topic I'm gonna talk about here is how we bring uh, other data source into our data lake. So one of the popular uh, data source at Peloton, uh, the sum of the microservice chose to use is the DynamoDB because of no SQL feature. So in order to bring the DynamoDB data into our data lake near real time, uh, we leverage a combination of enable the Dynamo stream, which is uh, the Kinesis data stream on AWS. But because we already have the Spark Hoodie writer, which can read the data from Kafka, 
We also leverage a DynamoDB Kafka connector where we fork from the open source so that the Spark Hoodie writer can directly read the data from Kafka instead of having a customized logic to read from Kinesis. And uh, based on that, we also have the similar reconciliation process we have for Postgres data so that the DynamoDB data in our data lake um, has a good quality. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, one of the biggest challenge we run into while we bring the DynamoDB data into data lake is how to determine the schema. So because of its NoSQL feature, we cannot um, just beforehand determine the schema in data lake because the schema uh, is going to change. So we have two general directions on how to tackle this. The first is we ask the stakeholders to do the data modeling for us. We're expecting them to know the concrete use case uh, from the DynamoDB data, and we can just keep a super data type for the data coming in and then write a view upon it so that they can create the data they want. But most of the time, our stakeholders like data scientist team actually want to do experiment and exploratory queries on the table, and they actually don't know what the data is going to look like either. So we actually choose a different route to do that, is that we want to dynamically infer schema based on the incoming JSON data, and then keep updating the schema in data lake. That actually results in a longer processing time because we have to parse the schema from the data in each batch, but we still manage to keep the SLA under 15 minutes. Upon that, we also leverage the daily snapshot and reconciliation process to do schema cleanup um, overnight. And I'll pass it back to Aaron to talk about how to propagate change uh, from Data Lake into downstream. Hey, everyone. Um, so now we covered a lot of challenges, but instead of uh, the, the next set of this, like uh, when we propagate these challenges down to Data Lake, Data Lake changes for our recommendation systems, uh, we were working out of Hoodie 13 at that point uh, when we were leveraging incremental reads. So the incremental reads uh, at that point were only like providing us uh, inserts and updates. Uh, so when we are propagating changes, the delete records were not passed through on the incremental read. This is as of last year. Uh, so the initial solution, like I know, uh, I know we I leveraged with the community, and they told it's coming. The CDC change, the CDC is part of 14 release but it was still uh, getting certified. So we couldn't wait uh, for that release at that point. So we came up with an initial solution to compare the snapshots of two days. Um, so comparing between two days, we get just the delete records that, that was deleted today, and then we propagated that. Um, that got us uh, with the initial solution, but as you could imagine, the snapshot difference uh, with billions of rows uh, would be highly memory and computer intensive. So what we did at that point is like, as we were processing the change data capture, we uh, captured the deletes and wrote it off separately into a deleted ID table. So which would be consumed uh, on the propagation side uh, for like deleting those records, right? So the in this way, like it's, it's essentially the hoodie CDC that uh, we managed to work with uh, until the 14 release was released, like is uh, available for us. So the long-term uh, fix is to move to uh, 14 and uh, higher. So in terms of monitoring the data lake, uh, these are the, uh, the high-level metrics in which we monitor. Like the data freshness, uh, we want to keep our data fresh. So in case of the data is not fresh, for like some of the, the workout data or something, which is like high frequency tables, there would be an update every in every hour of the day, right? So uh, we have our separate DAX that's running in, which looks at uh, any new inserts that happened in the last hour. If so, uh, it's then it, if not, it will trigger alerts for us. Then there is something wrong in the CDC or anything else that's happening that we may need to investigate. And the second thing is the timeliness. Uh, the SLA notification we have uh, like under an hour uh, timeliness for, for our CDC data to be available. Uh, in case we, if, if the EMR runs fail due to spot instances or any of that, 
it get we get notification so we could jump on and do any manual fixes that's needed and in terms of data quality all the hoodie metrics um, uh, help us to like push uh, the post the counts uh, in terms of all the inserts and updates so we compare those with the postgres counts so as you could see here uh, in data hub uh, we have assertions for for all the data quality uh, checks so as these assertions pass through, um, the data is certified for the downstream. If not, the sensors would fail uh, and push alerts for us. And the last is the latency, which is basically the Kafka consumer lag. Whenever the lag goes beyond a certain point, uh, where we have thresholds for, uh, we alerted uh, to just to know if any of the pipelines have to be uh, manually intervened. So in terms of next steps, uh, as I talked earlier, the short term is basically upgrading EMR. Um, we are currently on 6.12, uh, so upgrading it gets the hoodie version updated as well. And the long term is basically moving from micro batch uh, system that we have now to a real time streaming uh, using Apache Flink. Or, yeah, that's about us. Um, in terms of questions, um, so I, we did try to answer many of the questions that's, that was posted. Um, so I think one of the questions that Pavan asked is like, why hoodie and why not iceberg, right? Uh, so I think uh, one of the primary reason was the time travel feature when we looked at it, uh, hoodie had also quoted it earlier. So um, so that that is one of the powering reason for the recommendation team uh, to use it, so so we chose Hoodie at that point, and AWS also like um, at that point like backed us up uh, with uh, with choosing Hoodie, right? So both being the primary uh, reasons for us. And the second question Manish is asking is about uh, he chose Hoodie for time travel. What kind of queries you get where you need older data to read? So this is uh, this is basically like the recommendation teams. They might have to train their model as of say two weeks ago, or a week ago, or two days ago. So they would um, enforce the time travel feature to like read only like as of last night, uh, even though there might have been some uh, records that might have uh, come in after the midnight. They want to like train their models models only based on last midnight data, and not anything further. Um, so this in order to make the, the models much more accurate. So that that is the the feature that uh, we wanted. Um, feel free, Amre Shakini, if you want to jump in uh, to add anything. Feel free. Awesome. Um, I'm also scrolling through the questions. Um, thanks for taking time today, um, Peloton team, to you know share your journey and experience, and also uh, diligently answering through the questions. Um, we're also almost at time, but uh, I think the team will be like more than willing to answer the questions. If you have any more to follow through on the LinkedIn, please feel free to leave your comments there. Um, maybe we can give a minute or so if someone has questions. Um, and see. Yeah, and uh, I think some of the other questions that Manish asked was was about thirty five thousand table versions. Um, Amrish, do you want to take that? Yeah, so it's it's a combination of different things. So there was probably like a bug in one of the older versions of Hoodie. I think Aditya was saying they also faced a similar hype sync issue. So it would have been that. The other thing is we try to read NoSQL tables into data lake as well. As NoSQL has no fixed schema, that might be one reason. And this is since the inception of when we started writing Hoodie. So we it might be because of some of the design decisions on how we translate the data types from the source to the data lake. Like if you want to bring in all strings or if you want to keep data type parity and stuff. So it's a combination of all of them. and. Uh, added up over like one year or so. And then that's when the limits started hitting. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. And uh, Saumul has a question like, 
very curious to learn and hear from how you manage Delta Streamer jobs for PostgreSQL. So Saumal, we did not use Delta Streamer. We have our own custom hoodie writer. So I think I covered the reason why we used mainly because of the timing when that feature was released for Debezium support. Um, so we didn't move to uh, Delta Streamer. So I couldn't answer that question. And I see a question from Bibu Pala about, did you try EMR serverless? Uh, I think we we did some POCs with EMR serverless, but we never moved to production. Uh, with our initial uh, POCs, I think this was a while back, correct me team if I'm wrong, but we were seeing a lot of nodes being uh, terminated and then being recreated over and over again for a long running uh, table, uh, hoodie writing table. Uh, that increased our processing time, so we were not ready to move to serverless yet. Yeah, and most of our like data is also like change capture continuously, so the, the servers would be up uh, most of the time. So we didn't find a cost value uh, on that. I'll take one last question, and that's from. Uh, Metadata's uh, Sai Kumar posted like metadata size for each upsert and in insert uh, compared to Delta. Um, is is this, uh, if this is about CRW versus MOR, uh, the update size is the same, but even if there's a single row update and the existing base file is, let's say, 20 MB, you end up copying and rewriting the entire 20 MB file versus for the Delta log, if the incoming update is like 2 KB, you just append that 2 KB to an existing Delta log file or create a new file with 2 KB update. But if this is not what you are trying to see, I can answer in comments later on. Yeah, I think we're right about time. Um... Thanks to the and the Hudi community for our support and providing this opportunity. And thanks everyone for attending the talk. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Uh, thank thank you. you once again. And um, have a great rest of your day. And we'll meet you soon uh, in the next community sync. Thank you.